At Capella University, education is as smart as the world around us. With the FlexPath format, you can take classes at your own pace, set your own deadlines, and even leverage your previous experience to move faster. Now that's smart. Learn more at capella.edu. If you're a movie collector, you need Movies Anywhere. It pulls your favorite purchase movies from participating digital retailers into one central place so you can finally say goodbye to scattered movie collections and hello to an organized library. With Movies Anywhere, you can watch your favorite movies on any compatible device whenever and wherever you want. Ready to grow and enjoy your digital collection? Visit MoviesAnywhere.com slash welcome and register for free. Registration with Movies Anywhere required. Open to U.S. residents 13 and over. Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. I'm your speaker Casey and today we have new territory to bring to you all. Before we start, however, I wanted to remind you all of the excellent opportunity that I have been offered to attend Podcast Row at the 2022 CrimeCon in London. The event takes place over two days in June and my podcast is being featured amongst some incredible shows. If you would like to come and take part and come and spend some time with me, you can use the code CULTLIVE to receive 10% off ticket prices today. Just go to crimecon.co.uk and use the code CULTLIVE at the checkout to receive 10% off, or you can click the link in the episode description. Also, a big thank you to Jess and Leanne, two current patrons of the show that have increased their pledges this week. I'm so humbled by your support, and on top of this, I need to introduce my two new patrons, Ashley and the wonderful Spencer. With these two new pledges, I can't believe that I'm saying I am almost halfway to reaching the first Patreon goal. Thank you so much for both being here. I hope you enjoy the exclusive content, the goodies now on the way to you all that I have posted today, and you can also enjoy a 15% off code for CrimeCon 2022. Also, I've added the new names to the sponsor section of my website, and I really appreciate your support so much. Now, let's get on to the episode. Today I chat with Jordan who brings us the podcast's first official look at a sect of evangelism, with some parts sounding familiar and others sounding outright peculiar. I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. Here is Jordan. So hello Jordan and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to share your story with us today. This again is new territory for me so I am really looking forward to learning a bit more. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? My name is Jordan. Yeah I'm um, I was a part of uh, the German Baptist Brethren Church and there's more names for it but I can Get into that a little bit later. So I've got uh, a wife, got two kids, one dog, and a lot of religious trauma. And uh, um, I work in IT, so very technical. Which, as you'll hear, part of my story and how I grew up, you know, technical stuff is not encouraged or what have you in the group. So it's kind of a an odd career path, I would say, from my upbringing. But um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Perhaps it's your inner rebellion coming forward and uh, taking a stand on, uh, on some of the things that you were told to yeah. stay away from. <laughs> so, yeah, there's definitely a lot more where that came from, for sure. It, this, as, as I mentioned at the start, it's not a group that I've come across, not by the name German Baptist Brethren, but perhaps by maybe some of the other names. So, so can you tell us what those other names, what those other names are, and maybe one or two of them might be a bit more familiar to people. Yeah, it's kind of confusing because when you hear the word Baptist, you think like if you're from America and kind of the Bible Belt in the South, of like Southern Baptists or the American Baptist Convention, stuff like that. This group is not related to the traditional American Baptists in that sense. Um, right. The name Baptist just came from the, uh, the idea that they baptized again after infant baptism and that kind of that's why they're called anabaptists if that term is more familiar for people um the official name of the movement i grew up in is called the old german baptist brethren church um they split 
so they've split several times over the years, but the most recent major split was in 2009 and the more progressive movement. And I say progressive lightly because I mean, very, very conservative, but the more progressive movement called themselves New Conference. So you have the old German Baptist Brethren Church, Old Conference and New Conference. And then actually just recently within the past year, the Old Conference has split again. And so I'm not sure what those names are, but um, it is a part of the Brethren, uh, the Church of the Brethren, sort of, but they definitely are on their own. They're a lot closer to Mennonites or Hutterites or things like that. Um, If you can picture something in your mind, picture Amish, uh, minus the horse and buggies. So German Baptists do drive cars, they do have phones, they have electricity, but they look very similar to Amish, like old order Amish, where with the, um, the women wear dresses, head bonnets, um, the men have beards with no mustaches, black hats, that very old traditional style of dress. If I was to walk around and see some members of this particular faith, I might get confused with the Amish community. Yes. Yeah. And that happened a lot growing up. You know, we'd be in a store with my mom or my grandma and it's a lot easier to tell the women apart from the men because the women are, they stand out a lot more in public, but you know, we, we would get asked like, are you guys nuns or are you Amish? Like people just don't know. Um, But yeah, you would definitely turn your head if you were not from an area where, um, you know, plain, plain dressed people exist. So um, Pennsylvania, it wouldn't turn as many heads because there's a lot of Amish there. Was this an area, would you say this is an area that, that had um, a, a, a lot of Amish movement inside of it? Or or was it kind of interesting for people to come across members of your church and and kind of not be able to differentiate your faith-based movement to people involved in the Amish community? Well, from where we're from, there are no Amish. Um, I'm on the west side of the United States. Amish are typically on the, mainly around Pennsylvania, Indiana, those areas. Um, but these, the Anabaptist groups like Brethren and Hutterites and Mennonites and Old Order German Baptists and all this, they typically um, stay in a rural area and they don't try and um, assimilate into town life, I guess. The Amish call it um, the English. That's what they call non-Amish people. Um, We don't really have a word. We didn't have a word like that. It's just those are city people and we live in the country and we're our own group. And so you, you know, you could live in a town that had German Baptist in it and not see them ever probably because they just don't participate in activities that go on. Right, in right. I see. The Old German Baptist Brethren Church. Is that right? Old German Baptist Brethren Church, correct, yes. Is this a, a movement that you were born into, something your parents were already involved in, or is it something you found as, as you were growing up? Um, so the Anabaptist movement came out of like the 1500s. And then out of that, um, the Mennonites followed a guy named Menno Simons that came out of that. Ours was um, out of a, a guy by the name of Alexander Mack, I think in like the early 1700s, maybe late 1600s. Um, not exactly sure on that. So it's been around for a while. At some point, it came over to um, America. And I can trace my last name from my father's side all the way to like the 1500s, early 1500s in Germany. And I know all the names and which one of my ancestors came over to America to be with the church. So I can trace my family's lineage before German Baptist and then like in the 17 or early 1800s when one of my ancestors came to Ohio, I believe, and um, 
joined, came over with the church or to join the church or be a part of it. Uh, so basically my dad's side has been in it since, you know, oh, 200 and wow. years to 300 years, 1800. So that's 200 and some years. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very ingrained into our family. My, my mom though, she did not grow up religious. Um, she met my dad in high school and converted, I guess she, um, to become a member, you have to get baptized. And I'll talk a bit more about that process because it is very in-depth, but, um, she joined when she was like 17, I think, um, so that she could date my dad, I guess. And, um, and then they got married when she was 18 and, um, you know, I think she, she was always kind of an outsider because of that. Right. You know, they do accept you, but still it's like, kind of an outsider. You have to kind of give up everything and join. And the more I talk about this, the more I'm like, it really seems like a cult because you, you know, kind of give up your identity to join, if mm-hmm. you will. And you, if you came from the outside, you're sort of viewed as an outsider. Um, I don't want to say she was always an outcast, but. Um, well, sometimes we talk about like second, third, fourth generation. I don't even know if you would know what that would make you in terms of how far back your lineage and family involvement goes in this movement, kind of what generation that would make you being born into this, into this faith? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say like sixth, sixth or seventh. Um, I do. I mean, I, my uncle is really into our family history and all that because, you know, not many people can trace their, their last name, to a town in Germany that either was named after us or uh, we were named after the town. I'm not exactly sure because it gets a little murky way back in the 1500s, but Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that timeline in front of me, so I couldn't count, but, um, you know, I do know it's... A good few generations, a good few generations in. Yes. So your mum joins the church at 17. She is, I don't know if conversion converted is the right word because she's not changing from a different faith-based group perhaps she's changing from agnostic or atheist converted at 17 joins the church marries your father at at, at age 18 and then they have you are you an only child or do you have brothers and sisters uh no i have four siblings um my oldest sister so I'm, i'm the second my older sister was a member a baptized member um, none of the rest of my siblings joined officially. I mean, you're kind of a part of it, but you're not an actual like voting member or whatever, okay. um, until you get baptized. That is the, the joining, I guess. Um, she left right around the split, I think 2008 or 2009, right before the split. Um, and I followed her out cause I was looking for a ticket out of there. <laughs> um, but the, none of the rest of my siblings ended up joining. You, you've talked a little bit about sort of how this group was founded and a little bit about its history. I don't know if there's anything that you think is prevalent to mention in terms of the backstory of this of this mm-hmm. particular church before we move on to your story specifically. Yes, there's a few things that I think will help guide or make sense of some stories I tell later on. So since the German Baptists origins are tied in with the Anabaptist movement, which is a much larger movement, um, it helps to know why the Anabaptists broke away from what they broke away from. So back in the 1500s, they broke away from the church of England or Catholic church. I think church of England specifically, because they did not, they, they rejected specifically infant baptism. They did not believe that, that was the way to salvation because an infant can't make a choice. And so they would rebaptize themselves as adults when they made a choice to follow Christ or something like that. And so they were, at some point they got nicknamed disparagingly as dunkers or dunkards, or like in the old German, it would be like tunkers, I think with a T. Um, and that nickname stuck. They adopted it kind of, kind of like uh, other groups have done, like, you know, queer was a, derogatory term until it just got adopted by 
those people as like, well, you're going to call us that. We're just going to embrace it. And so that was sort of what they did. You're going to make fun of us as dunkers. Well, we dunk. So fine. We're, we're sticking with it. Um, in 1708, I mentioned Alexander Mack. He started the Schwarzenau Brethren, which was like, I think, a town in Germany where they all agreed to join up and start a new movement. And somewhere out of that, the German Baptist came out of that. They, um, I think the, a bigger part of why they wanted to start their own movement was kind of, it was a pacifistic thing. There was a lot of fighting and torture and stake burning between the Catholics and the Protestants. And they rejected that because that was not what, you know, Christ taught in the New Testament. They wanted to do away with all the violence associated with it. Um, I know I've heard stories where, you know, these Anabaptist pastors or preachers or leaders would get their tongues cut out so they couldn't preach. Like they, I mean, it was, that's part of why they, you know, moved to America as well to get away from the persecution because the Church of England did not want this movement happening. So there's a lot of very interesting history. If, if any of the listeners really like church history and, you know, how movements start and move around. Um, but the, the biggest thing is baptism as an adult and um, pacifism. And those are key, key parts to um, who the German Baptists are. And also not having, you know, the king of England being the head of the Church of England or the Pope being the head of the Catholic Church, they reject um, a leader like that specifically. What You know, one face to the, the movement that you worship or hold in higher regard. And sometimes I think because of that, I have a hard time saying, oh, it was a cult. There's no leader that you have to listen to. There's no person you can point at that's calling the shots. Uh, you know, obviously that's a more common version of what cults are. Um, you know, they, this organization has a lot of the other <laughs> characteristics of a cult or high demand religion. Now we know a little bit of the church's history. Oh, what was it like at, at the point where you were growing up in the church? What did it look like in terms of daily commitments to church related activities were, were you expected to kind of just go once a week uh did you practice any sort of prayer before dinner or bed or what what did it look like in terms of commitments to, to church activities um yeah i mean we had a weekly service every sunday as most christian groups do um there would be maybe like a once a month, um, they would get together for what they call a singing. And so there's no musical instruments at all. It's all acapella. And so they would gather in a shop or a barn somewhere, that, never at the church, interestingly enough. It was always at somebody's shop, but you just bring your hymnal and sing for several hours. And usually there'd be food or desserts or something like that. It's just kind of like a, a worship night, if you will. Um, outside of the once a year, uh, communion time, which I will go into a little bit more because it's quite involved. Um, there typically wasn't a lot expected of you. There would be what's called an annual meeting, which is usually typically on the East coast or Midwest where all of the groups from all over the U S would get together and vote on things and make policy, but you weren't expected there. Um, so that those were just some of the more organized things that you're expected to be a part of, but, uh, not, I wouldn't say it was over the top. So you've got two commitments a week, sort of one in the church, one, some, somewhere random <laughs> where the, these, faith-based activities take place and then the kind of throughout the year there's one or two different events that are peppered throughout that you kind of have the choice on whether to attend or not um so it's yeah. not it's not too demanding in that sense of kind of all of your spare time in the week is taken up by church related activities but you've mentioned that there's a few things intrinsic to the movement that are high demanding in terms of the baptism 
and the communion and uh, a few things that you've mentioned as as we've gone through so what did it look like for your mum when she was when she was baptized was it the same for her as it was for when you were baptized or was it different uh, did it change in between uh, i never got baptized so i mean you know the age where you're expected to kind of make a choice would be between 13 to 18 and i left when i was 15 um I don't know what others' expectations were for me. I didn't care. I wanted to get out, and I couldn't until my sister left. But, you know, for my mom, what what it looks like when somebody's going to join and get baptized um, is, I mean, they have to know you and your character and, and who you are beforehand. So you couldn't just walk off the street and say, hey, I, I like this. I want to get baptized. That wouldn't go. Because when you uh, voice your interest in getting baptized and joining. I mean, it's, it's, they're one in the same, you get baptized and you join the German Baptist church as a member. Okay. Yeah. Um, they are, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. You could not join as a member without getting baptized. Meaning if I had been baptized and I was at a different church and then I said, okay, I want to be a German Baptist. Um, but I've been baptized. They would make me get re-baptized by a German Baptist minister. Okay. Okay. And once you are baptized, does it make it significantly harder to leave the movement? Do you think? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, it would. Um, so in order to get baptized, part of like the vetting process is, if you will, is some elders or deacons or a, a kind of a mix um, of the two would go to your house and talk to you and kind of talk about some of the verses that mentioned baptism, what it is and, you know, make sure, are you good? Or do you agree with the church's stance on things? You know, just kind of the double checking. And then uh, on one Sunday, you know, they'll set a date and everyone knows it. Um, they'll cut the church service a little bit short and um, ask the family and the of the person getting baptized and the baptized person to leave the building. And then the head elder will take a vote. And Or it's not really a vote. It's more of a does anyone have any reason why, you know, so-and-so should not be a member of the church and get baptized? And then they'll go down and the elder points at every member in the, in the pews. Uh, and it's either, you know, should they be received as a member and you nod your head or, um, you know, should they not be a member and you shake your head? I've never seen anybody not become a member <laughs> during these right. votes. That would be really awkward. But uh, after the vote, you know, they bring them back in. Okay, everyone said, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't become a member. And then they'll talk to them for a little bit longer about it. And then everybody drives to a specific spot on at a river we have here locally. And uh, so the elder and the baptizee will walk out and they ask three questions. Do you agree to... Um, renounce Satan in all of his pernicious ways? Do you uh, vow to, con um, to uphold the principles of nonviolence, non-swearing, and non-conformity? Nonviolence is the pacifism, so no defending yourself if you're getting robbed, no going to war, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, no, none of it. You're not going to strike anybody because Jesus was pacifistic. And then non-conformity means you don't look like those in the world, those who are not saved. So you dress like us, you talk like us, you act like us. You do not act like the other Christians, the other worldly people. Um, and then there was one other thing I'm kind of forgetting. They ask three specific questions. You say yes, and then they baptize you. They dunk you three times, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then you're a member. And this is where people are going to be like, okay, this is weird, <laughs> because the German Baptists take the New Testament extremely literally. And so that's the head coverings. That's um, how you do communion. That's how you treat other members of the church. You don't sue anybody. They do not go to court at all for any reason whatsoever. Um, so part of that is greeting one another with the holy kiss. So members of the German Baptist church will 
when they greet each other, kiss on the lips, same sex. Um, and it's not like a big weird thing. I mean, it's usually just like a quick peck, but I just grew up as normal, you know, watching, you know, people at the church greet each other. Hey, Bob, how's it going? Pretty good. You know, Sam and shake hands and kiss on the lips. Same for the women. So this new member, is, as they come out of the water, um, everyone starts singing a hymn and one by one, the members of the church go through and greet the new member. Uh, you know, if, let's say it was, it was a man getting baptized. The, the women would give a hug or shake hands, usually shake hands, and the men would greet with a kiss. And you greet every <laughs> member of the church as a, as a new member with the holy kiss. I thought yeah. that you meant that everybody got kissed on the lips. I didn't realize that you meant it was it was restricted only to to, yes, to same sex kisses. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's so that is so interesting. So if yeah, I got it's baptized, peculiar for sure. It is I've never heard of anything like that before. If I got baptized today, all the women in the room would then kiss me on the lips, but the men would just shake my hand. Correct. That is so strange. I've heard of well, I've heard of other groups where they will kiss, they will, will greet like intersex like with a kiss. So it's like men will kiss women. Those are maybe just rumors. Some kids at church, you know, were spreading to be dumb. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't verify that. But there's so many things here. So first of all, that kind of reminds me of, of a part of the one of the Nexium documentaries when you see like Keith Raniere just kissing everybody. Like that's what initially popped into my mind. But then I'm also thinking, what if you grew up in this community and it was very, very insular so that when you stepped out and tried to kind of pave your own way, like just walk. (laughs) What if you were just like, thanks for my coffee and then tried to like give that person a kiss? Like, because that's like what you grew up thinking was like. normal (laughs) do you know what I mean like to a sticky situation if that's how they thought you know that you greet people and there's enough uh you know going to town and seeing other people and and all that and knowing family members who've left and stuff that I think most people recognize when and where greeting with a kiss is appropriate Mm -hmm. and not Mm-hmm. And and some so, listeners are probably thinking, well, they do it in France, you know, they do it in, in other countries. It's customary to meet somebody and give them a kiss on the cheek or whatever. But it's just very specific that it's same sex kisses on the lips. Um, and I, yeah. I wonder well, then that, that <laughs> leads me on to the question of what is the church's stance on the LGBTQIA plus community? Is it aligned with, with the kind of acceptance of that community or is it just a strange custom that's come from uh, the, the, the doctrine, as, as you mentioned, the kind of literal interpretation of the new Testament? Yeah. I mean, LGBTQ um, members would not be accepted whatsoever. Um, That's a, Grave, grave sin. It's very clear in the Old and New Testament, if you read it literally, that it's a sin. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Um, you know, part of taking the Old or the New Testament, or all of it, I guess, literally, is um, when it says, greet each other with a holy kiss, you greet each other with a holy kiss. And when it says, uh, you know, you can't be gay, then you can't be gay. And when it says, um, you cannot get divorced and remarried, uh, that's they're probably just as strict and and hardlined about divorce and remarriage as they would be about homosexual relationships, which is typically odd for let's say like American evangelical conservative style churches because conservative evangelicalism is very different. It's very rooted in nationalism, like American nationalism, and all sorts of crazy stuff. There, German Baptists are not political at all. You will never hear them advocating for a political party. They don't vote at all. No voting. Uh, I don't think my dad, at this, he's left the group since then, and he still has never voted, um, as far as I know. Uh, so very, very divorced from politics. Like, nope, not doing it because our kingdom is not of this world. Like, we belong to, you know, we're heirs with with Christ, and we do not belong on earth. We belong, you know in heaven with, with Christ. So we, 
we're not going to vote. We're not going to run for office. We're not going to hold office. We're, we don't care. We don't even participate in uh, war. So during World War II, when people were getting drafted, um, they had they, they had a very special agreement with the government because of the religious beliefs that um, they were drafted as what's called um, conscientious objectors, COs. And so, you know, they would go maybe cook or make tents or do something nonviolent. Um, and actually there was a movie about, I think a seventh day Adventist, uh, Andrew Garfield played the, the army guy, but he, he wouldn't pick up a rifle and fight. He saved a bunch of guys and it's all a true story, but he, he was a pacifist. He would not fight. Yeah. And was it called Hacksaw Ridge that, yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hacksaw I Ridge. saw that movie. I thought it was actually quite moving. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and the pacifism, you know, the nonviolence, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, when I was initially leaving the group, I thought, you know, it's cowardly. Like if somebody's trying to come in and steal stuff or kill my wife and kids, like I'm going to defend myself. But, you know, so there's, I guess everyone can be how they want, but I do appreciate looking now at conservative evangelicalism as I'm leaving that, um, you know, the, the idea that, you know, war, war is bad. We don't, you know, we should not go be bombing other countries. We, we, we don't need to participate in the taking of other human life. And mm-hmm. so I, I can appreciate the pacifism and there is um, a thing called neo Anabaptists now, which is like a newish movement where they're not, they don't have all the old order stuff, but they do like the pacifism and some of these other things mm-hmm. um, that they're kind of co-opting out of it. But it's it's a hard one that is now. I mean, I know it's a can of worms and there's so many different layers and things that we could discuss, but you've kind of like already mentioned there the difficulties in that particular belief system because it's different going to war and fighting on a global or a national or you know, kind of government scale. Mm-hmm. than it is to like as you said stop a home invader like is they're very different they're two extremely different things right. and it's 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 kind of like oh, also i'm sure there were people in the war that weren't conscientious objectors that did bear arms whether that's right or wrong i'm not here to that's not what we're here to discuss but i'm sure there are still people that went to great lengths to save as many people as they could like the character, like the man in Hacksaw Ridge, who Andrew Garfield played, who was based on a on a on a real person. And seventh I don't, day, seventh day yeah, seventh day, seventh day, and I don't know his name off the off the top of my head. I can't remember what that man's name was. I'm sure it's like a really famous name. Um, <laughs> so I probably sound really ignorant right now, but you know, I'm sure that there were people that did fight in those environments that too did try to save as many people as they could but then also shot other people because they were on the other side uh, so it's like it's really difficult one to wrap your head around and like you said uh you know if somebody was threatening your family would you stand there and and say that that's okay because that's kind of the promise you made when you were baptized or is it ingrained in us to use that yeah to use that fight or flight or freeze kind of built in defense system that we have i don't know it's 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 a really interesting one to ponder i don't think there's a a right answer it's just something that i'm kind of i'm voicing as i'm thinking it through but it's definitely an interesting thing to consider. And there are some there are some examples. Um, so this is Amish. You may remember probably 15 years ago now, um, somebody went into an Amish schoolhouse and shot and killed a bunch of young children. This is back in Pennsylvania or Indiana. I don't know. Um, and the Amish group forgave the shooter you know, the parents of these children, they forgave the shooter, they forgave the family that, you know, they went to court or, and whatever, and and voiced, we forgive you. Christ told us to forgive, we forgive you. There are other stories uh, of German Baptists specifically, where um, there was one, one young family, they were in 
Ohio somewhere and, and somebody tried to rob him, pulled him over, robbed him and shot his husband and wife and she died and the husband was paralyzed or, you know, left a lot of kids behind and they made a statement. Hey, we forgive the person who shot them. We want to forgive you. Like, you know, we, it's very, very different from normal people's reactions to somebody who just killed, you know, the mother of all these children or something like that, because it's not natural. Right. And I think that's part of their Christian beliefs and taking them as seriously as the German Baptist or the Anabaptists do is Christ told us to forgive everyone. He forgave those who were crucifying him on the cross while he was up there. Right. Like that was, that's the model and they do it really, really well. Uh, you know, whether or not that's a good, you know, a good thing in, in life, they, they typically put their money where their mouth is when it comes to this. I, I'm not going to say that there have been non uh, germ Baptists who were not violent, but for the most part, as a group, they tend to follow those beliefs to the extreme. Mm -hmm. It's, it's definitely one of those that's worth thinking about on a, on a, much more in-depth level kind of like the discussions that we've had on the podcast around circumcision in newborns in judaism and whether that is right or wrong and then the blood doctrine with jehovah's witnesses and whether that is right or wrong and, and all of these things that these different faith-based groups practice that a lot of people have differing opinions on i think it's it's definitely all worth considering on a much deeper level and and this mm -hmm. is something that i would add to that list of conversations to have around ethics and morals and doctrine specific to different faith-based faith-based groups but um i had a quick just a quick google then it's desmond t doss was the name of the man okay the yeah, yeah, Ridge doss, was based yeah. on so um anybody that's kind of screaming that at their uh headphones or <laughs> car speakers or, or however they're listening we've, we've cleared that one up um and i do remember the uh the i think it was the west nichols mine school that was the Amish shooting in pennsylvania and i i only Sounds remember that cool. one because i've been doing some research into uh conspiracy theories on school shootings supposedly being false and people have made them up oh, they never God, really happened no. it's awful it's awful so i've just kind of been doing a little bit of research into those recently and um i think it was the west nickel mine school it was like yeah, a one one right. bedroom classroom in pennsylvania mm -hmm. um in La is it lancaster lancashire yeah Lan lancaster lancaster county yep so um a lots, lot of amish in that area yep so that's uh, that's that's the name of that one as well. Um, but I just wanted to kind of go back to something that you mentioned previously, and that was around divorce and how it was it, it, it's mm -hmm. taken extremely seriously within this group, almost as, yes. as much as um, you know, no sex before marriage and marriage between mm -hmm. one man and one woman. So, yeah. have you ever experienced? anybody going through the divorce process in the church and how that may have changed their position in the church and how people viewed them or anything around how seriously that particular piece of rhetoric is taken. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one thing here that I parallel it to a little bit or contrast it with, and maybe this is more for the American listeners, but conservative evangelicalism as it's, kind of gotten out of hand over the past several years is like anti-gay to the extreme. Like, you know, it's shocking like that the main focus is on um, anti-LGBTQ protesting and all this stuff. And churches that are affirming are just sacrilegious. They don't even belong to, allowed to call themselves Christians kind of thing. Well, in these churches that are screaming anti-gay stuff, they have multiple divorce, serial divorce, you know, members who are on their third husband, third wife, whatever. And they're totally accepted as a member of that church or that group. It's no problem. Um, in the German Baptist community, divorce is like as bad a sin as coming out as gay. 
Um, if you, for, if you, let's say you're a wife and, and we had a, someone in our community this way, um, she had a couple, three kids, the husband decided he just wanted, wanted to leave separated. He wanted to go do his own thing. She wouldn't divorce him unless he wanted the divorce that she would accept, but he just wanted to be separated. So he ran off, did his thing. She stayed single and raised her kids as a single mom for a really long time um, until he decided he wanted to be reconciled. And then she accepted him back after that. That was the expectation for her. She would stay single. She would not divorce him and she would wait for, you know, the Lord to convict him to come back. Uh, my great grandmother, uh, her husband, my great grandpa, he left her. Uh, I, I think he was cheating on her for a bit, ran around and then, he left the well. He was left or kicked out of the German Baptist. I'm not sure, and he never came back. She never remarried. I don't know if they got divorced or not, but um, she was single for. I mean, she died at like 105, <laughs> so she was single for a really, really long time. There was uh, some single people at our church who both had been divorced, or one or the other had been divorced. And they wanted to be married. They were a little older, maybe in their 50s. They wanted to be married, and the church would not perform the marriage. They wouldn't allow it because one or both had been divorced. And so they didn't get married. I mean, obviously, they loved each other, and they wanted to be together, but the church would not allow it. And so they stayed single. I mean, they take it very, very seriously. That is so sad to think about how many people are living such lonely lives because of how seriously this this mm -hmm. is taken and it it's kind of almost infuriating as well to hear the story about you know the the mm -hmm. the lady in, in your congregation and also uh, mm -hmm. of your is it was it your great grandma you said great grandma yeah Yep. It's almost like these men, and I know that there'll be women out here that, that are like this as well. I'm not just saying, oh, men. But it's almost <laughs> like they were like, I can have my cake and eat it too. Like, I can be married to this woman and have this family, and she will raise the kids, and she will look after the home, and she will do the things that are expected of her, as is written yeah. in the in in the biblical text that that we use <laughs> and, and that that we kind of use as a guide for our lives but i can also go off and do what i want and know that she'll always be there and i can just come back whenever so i'm gonna go off and i'm gonna frolic around and i'm gonna have this freedom and and do whatever you know and then when yeah. when the grass is not greener on the other side, it's like I'll oh, just come, just come back, back and, and she'll just take me back, and and that is so well, she, frustrating. She has to, to. yeah, absolutely, to. yeah, because otherwise she is going to be what excommunicated or or shunned. I don't know what would happen if she said no. I don't want to be reconciled. I, I don't even think that for a, a woman in the church in this situation that would even be an option. Unfortunately, I mean, of course she can leave, but, you know, if you're a single woman, this is your community. Like if you leave, you have no help. You are uh, absolutely screwed. Yeah, you're yeah. screwed. Yeah. Which is what I was just going to mention then about kind of your, your mum converting into the church at 17, which is quite a young age to then be married yeah. at 18. And then, you know, if, if that is the standard for women within this religious movement, where is the space and time to build up some level of independence <laughs> and put, you know, your own oh. money, money aside and have your own, like, you know, your own safety net to fall back on. It's, it's very much encouraging that codependency so that you don't have the opportunity to remove yourself from oh, yeah. this community if you want to. So straight away, you're encouraging that, that dependence on, on, on the community itself and your partner and the church yep. Um, well, which is kind of kind of the mark of obviously a cult is that dependency in the group, so you can't leave. I mean, yeah, it it's very misogynistic when you look outside of it and you care about egalitarianism or, or women's rights or equal rights. You know, um, I don't think. I mean, the German Baptists are very um, not egalitarian, but uh, complementarian. They would say, 
uh, you know, and I can go in a little more about that, but yeah, you mentioned getting married at 18. The women are expected to get married young. And I think, you know, typically you have a 24, 25 year old man who would marry like an 18 year old. Sometimes it's younger men getting married, but typically they, the men are expected to kind of work a little bit and be able to provide. So they would wait a few more years. I have attended multiple weddings where the bride was 17 at the time. Um, I have heard of weddings where the bride was 16. That may have been, you know, a while back. I don't think that's as common. Um, there, my, my younger sister's friend is like 19 and already has a kid. Um, you know, they, they typically, <laughs> you'll find they have a baby about nine months after the wedding date because uh, they don't believe in birth control. Okay. Yeah, you know, the Lord, the Lord's got your family plan and mind. And so you do what's natural and you'll have kids when you have them. Very large families, very, very large families. You know, I, I know families with 12 kids, um, 12 plus. So, you know, for the woman, uh, career and making money is not encouraged. Uh, she's dependent on the husband. Uh, her job is to get married and and raise children and make, make the home and, you know, be that, homemaker. Uh, that is really her only options. I, there are some German Baptist women who became nurses. Um, but you know, that's not because they need a second income. It's because she just really wanted to be a nurse and kind of fought for it, Mm -hmm. that career path. And it's a part-time gig, maybe, you know, um, very, yeah, men, men are the, the men, right? They, they're the provider. They work six days a week really, really hard. Sundays, there are absolutely no work and the women raise the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no, nothing outside of that. Not only is the wife dependent on the husband, but then the children are dependent on the mom who is also the wife. So if you are married at 16, 17, 18 years old, and you're having children nine nine months to a year later, again, not, not only are you creating that dependency on the husband and the community and the church, but you're also not giving that person a chance to realize their own identity. They are then a, a wife and yeah. a mother. And that is, and that is yeah. what, who they are. And there, there is nothing, you know, there's no opportunity for that person to form an identity. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Like, well, and, oh, and I think it, think it makes, about. it makes sense because, um, in this all in Christianity, uh, there's this concept that your identity doesn't matter. Your identity is in Christ, right? He gives you your identity and it's all written out. You know, the, the new Testament talks about what men should be, what women should be, or tradition has told us what it should be. So that is your identity. You don't get to go, you know, have some other identity. It doesn't matter. There are no singers up on stage everyone sings at the same level so there is no individual who sticks out and above uh there are no artists because we don't paint (laughs) that's that's vain that's not what we do our identity is in christ raising kids so that we can have more christians more members of the church like yeah you know i think that was one of the questions either in the bite model or something that you'd asked about identity and i go well No, your identity doesn't get taken away. You have a driver's license. You can go, you know, you're still, you got the same name. Like they don't change your identity. But now that I'm sitting here talking about it, um, your identity is stifled or you're just not allowed to find it maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, here and there a little bit, but not like it should. I mean, when you get married at 17 and then have kids soon after, 17 or 18, have kids soon after, you don't get a chance to go find out what you like to do. What yeah. Yeah. Like, about. yeah. Like kind of pick up the guitar or, um, well, no musical yeah. instruments. So they wouldn't wow. do that anyways. Is that because they're yeah. seen as worldly items? You know, I think it's just the tradition, right? They're very stuck in the 1800s. So even though they drive cars and have phones, uh, certain things, they're very traditional about, and that is the way they worship, which, you know, the, the hymn book does not have musical notes in it. It's, um, a small little black book 
maybe uh, the size of a pack of cards, a little bit bigger. And it's just got um, lines of text, like four lines of text in a block. And so what will happen if you're going to sing a hymn is the, a deacon will read off those four lines and then they sing those four and then they stop and the deacon reads off the next four lines and then they sing those stop on and on. The reason they do that is not everybody had hymn books way back in the day. And uh, so the, the deacon or somebody who had the hymn book would read off the lines and then they would repeat after that. Well, they never dropped that tradition, even though everyone has hymn books. Right, right. Okay. So it's, you know, there, if you're doing that still from the 1800s, there's no reason to ever even consider bringing an instrument into it. Newer movement is more accepting of it, but not in the traditional church services, right. maybe at home. And the reason I mentioned sort of the worldly aspect is sometimes music is seen as a way to invite Satan in. Um, uh, oh, like or, dancing and stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, it and in terms of your individuality, just to circle back to that quickly, it, it, it was almost kind of already laid out for you that you're expected to not, be an individual and not be independent and that that would be vain and narcissistic because of the the, the conformity mm-hmm. the conformity part of the baptism that you know where you are expected to say that you will kind of conform to the church and no other way yeah. of life or any other way of thinking so right it's it's kind of already put to you there that your independent traits don't matter because it's only your work for Christ that is important and I think that's really interesting mm-hmm. that that you it, it's not like you, you don't know that's what's happening you're you're very much kind of aware that that's what's expected of you it's 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 not a it's not a bug it's a feature you know like yeah you know that it's very very sacrificial very we die to ourselves you know we take up our cross daily we we bless others. So if, if there's a member of the church who's sick, right. And they need help because we don't have traditional, uh, medical insurance. Typically the church pays all the medical bills, like hundred percent. Okay. if somebody needs help, like for instance, if somebody's building a house, they'll do a couple weekends and they call them the work day and everyone comes out and they'll frame up a house. Wow. That's great. That's great. Yeah, so it's very, very community oriented, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and they'll even help some members outside the community as not really an outreach, but like you know, if, if a need arises and yeah, stuff, giving back they, to the community, they help. yeah, yeah, and, and that's great or, to hear, you know, that that some of the, I'm guessing that members of the church they give a, a tithe, so it's 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 nice for members yeah. to know where that money is being directed to i guess i would assume it's a tithe i i was never really a part of some of the background of the money and stuff i do know that it's kind of as a need arises right so if we need to build a new church then you know everyone gives as they can and Mm -hmm. i i don't know if tithe is expected i don't remember that specifically but you know it's it's um not quite socialistic where like Hutterites, for instance, live in a community and there is no money on an individual level. German Baptists are not that way. They do have individual money. They work and own land on their own. Right. But if the need arises, they they give and give and give until it's taken care of. You know, they sent a, a group down when Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana. Mm-hmm. My dad was a part of that group and they went down and just volunteered, just helped out. You know, they anytime there's stuff like that, like Haiti earthquakes, they'll send yeah. groups down to help. So they're they're very um, giving and yes, you know that yeah they they do want to do good. That, when we talk sense. about religion and faith and living your life uh, using these biblical texts as 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 guidebooks on how to do things the right way, these charitable efforts that you've just mentioned here those are the types of things that we would expect to hear about because that's Mm -hmm. surely surely the right way to live and the right way to be and so it's kind of refreshing to hear that that those things are happening but also important to remember on the flip side of this that there are women um and, and most likely men too who are living extremely 
lonely, stressful lives taking care of an entire family because the other person's decided to leave them and they can't divorce. Uh, otherwise, they give up their yeah. entire livelihood. So, um, well, that, that doesn't difficult. happen. That's 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 few and far between. You know, I, I brought up some examples, but mm-hmm. typically, I mean, you you are expected to make that marriage work, and uh, I think there's even more people in an absolutely miserable, right. sexless, unfun, just miserable marriage because it is not an option, mm-hmm. and I'm mm-hmm. sure their kids just hate it because their dad's abusive and angry and their mom's miserable because the marriage is miserable and they don't tell people that and it's hard because I think back to me at the age of 17 or an 18 and I didn't really know who I was or what I wanted no way, if yeah. I would have had to pick a life partner at that age I probably would have made a ghastly decision so oh yeah, um, yeah. but it is it is it is again refreshing to hear that that this group is making positive efforts to to have that charitable association with with the more disadvantaged that that mm-hmm. that we come across especially when well, it's, it's very specific right so it's like okay a natural disaster hit let's go help but mm-hmm. if it was like hey the aids epidemic is hitting the gay community well no we're not helping that right you know? okay, um, yeah. hey there's there's women down at the domestic violence shelter who need help well we're not going to help the domestic violence shelter because they are progressive. They don't, they know it's not a Christian thing. So we'll help a woman who comes to us who needs help in a domestic violence situation, but we're not going to go fund, you know, an organization Mm -hmm. that provides those services because I will say that's one thing they don't do is, is work with organizations in a community like that. They would just work on a more individual level. Okay. But I don't want to take away from, you know, yeah, some of the yeah, benefits yeah. of those of that mindset um i think yeah. one one thing that's hard is you know if you need help and you're an outsider coming in you can you know be accepted they do want visitors to come to the church and see the church services and start to join the group but mm-hmm. if you leave it's like why would you ever leave this um you know, why would you leave us? Like, what is wrong with us that you think you need to go somewhere else to get your religion or your community? And that's probably where the whole high demand religion, aside from the crazy dress and the kissing on the lips and the mm-hmm. church mm-hmm. expectations and, you know, how the services go and the singing, it's like trying to leave and how difficult that is and how much you're like ripping yourself out of a community is um, kind of where the high demand cult life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I imagine a lot of the religious trauma that's associated with members trying to leave the group or remaining in the group and being very much kind of disenchanted. And, um, you know, like the conversation that I had around Jeffrey Wallace in his book, um, where we spoke about him being physically in, mentally out as a Jehovah's Witness. A lot of the religious trauma that comes with, you know, having to stay in the group because it's it's too difficult to leave um, is, uh, is, is, again, very difficult. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more. Holidays are here, and so is fashionable fitness. Gift yourself a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G, a phone that folds in half to literally stand on its own. Pair it with the Galaxy Watch 4 for ultimate wellness and wow factor. Check health stats, flex personal records. Over 90 activities can be tracked, like biking, swimming, golfing, and more. Invest in yourself with tech made to crush goals. Holidays open up with Galaxy. Shop it all at Samsung.com. 5G connection and availability may vary. Check with Carrier. Products sold separately. With the, the whole divorce thing, I'm guessing that 
widows and widowers that's a slightly different situation because they're no longer mm -hmm. with their partner but do they have the opportunity to to remarry it in that situation yeah yep so uh spouse dies you can remarry um that's not an encouragement to murder your spouse <laughs> uh no there yeah there have been several uh, like for instance my grandma her her husband my biological grandfather uh, he died and way back in like the seventies. And so she remarried. And so my, okay, my grandparents on my father's side is a blended family. Um, and that was, you know, accepted and, and it's encouraged actually, cause it's not good for man to be alone and he needs a helper. Right. Uh, so as long as you are in the sanctioned relationship, it's great. Um, but, uh, yeah, not, not divorce and not even, because of infidelity, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So, if it's if it's found out that a, a husband or a wife is being unfaithful, do they do, do the is the marriage is just expected to continue and you work on trying to be a better husband or wife? Yeah, you need to work on reconciliation. Absolutely. If one member does not want to, um, you know, obviously they can go do whatever they want, but the more faithful member would then be expected to just be in that separation, be single and wait, you know, and pray and right. hope for the other spouse's reconciliation, which, you know, in the case of the one woman I was talking about took 15, 20 years, but yeah. well, maybe not yeah. 20, but 15 years. And eventually, you know, he, I guess came back around. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know all the details, but he was gone for a long time and she just waited it out. Mm -hmm. very very tough for her i'm sure absolutely i can imagine well i can't imagine being left with children to raise and the and and then on on top of that the prospect of not meeting somebody else that can come into your life to you know not not necessarily help with the children even but just to kind of alleviate some of the loneliness that comes from no longer having a life partner present in the in the family mm -hmm. home um yeah but if marriage is seen as such an important rite of passage that that, that that should be treated with so much respect are the marriage ceremonies like really spectacular and special to behold or are they just kind of typical church-like ceremonies um weddings aren't that i mean all I ever knew for like, until I was like 18, I never went to a non-German Baptist wedding or maybe one since till I was 18. It's, it's usually large. I mean, we're talking three, four 500 people at these weddings. Um, no music. So they'll designate a group of singers who typically, it's not like your traditional worship. It's like we picked some songs and then these acapella mm -hmm. singers mm -hmm. are there. Um, and then you stand up in front. It's pretty traditional. They've got, people bridesmaids groomsmen standing with them they do the kiss and everything typically the the sermon does last a little longer than most other christian like wedding um uh, mm -hmm. ceremonies but then um there's always food uh, i think that's expected and then um i mean it's just pretty plain i mean they put flowers out and stuff but it's not i don't think that the focus is to have this massive extravagant, you know, wedding, obviously no alcohol. Cause it's, there's no alcohol at all at the church. Um, and I, I always thought they were pretty boring to be honest. Cause I was just a kid at a boring wedding, but I wouldn't say they stand out as odd compared to others. When you talked in your communication with me about communion, you did mention that there was, there was, wine so is there no it yeah sorry <laughs> yes no, it's okay so alcohol it's okay. is alcohol is not something that you say that you drink you don't go buy it i mean german baptists drink they do uh it's kind of like the joke about um the jews don't recognize jesus as the messiah the the um protestants don't recognize the pope as the leader of the church and the baptists do not recognize each other at the liquor store <laughs> um, okay so <laughs> yeah. they do drink uh just not together so you know if there was a uh, you have 
people over for dinner. That's one thing German Baptists do a lot is have families over for dinner, three or four families and big old table and cook a lot of food, no alcohol. Uh, but if, you know, each one of them may just end up go home and have a glass of wine or something like that, or a beer, just depending on how uh, conservative and plain or plain they are. So it's just not talked about the communion for wine is just kind of like a really sweet, like, you know, you just take a sip. It's, it is alcoholic, but it's not. Right. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, I don't know if the Catholic church also does alcoholic wine for their communions. And but, um, so, the, you know, that you get, this is probably a good segue to talk about the communion process because it is not just a, a wafer and wine on some random Sunday. It's right. A, okay. It's a thing. Do you want to transition to that? or Yeah, that would be else? fantastic. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. All right. So they call it love feast, uh, not communion. And it's, you know, each district would do it once a year. So in my state, there are three districts. Um, so basically people from the surrounding districts will, will come in for this. Uh, they'll drive several hours. I mean, some will fly in if they've got family. So they may fly from the East coast to the West coast to stay with family for these drive up from other States, maybe 12, 14 plus hours. Um, at our house. So nobody stays in hotels at all. Everyone always stays in somebody else's house. Okay. So at our house, we would, I mean, our basement would have, you know, dividers up and we'd have three or four families staying at our house. Wow, and it was okay. a lot of fun because we always had people with, you know, boys my age and stuff. And so we just play outside running around hooting and hollering and had a great time. I mean, it was honestly like the funnest weekend of the year for us as kids, just because you got to stay up late and you're with people that you don't get to be with all the time. And yeah, yeah. Um, so it kind of starts Friday. Friday is people getting stuff ready because they, they have a lot of meals and stuff. So they're cooking food. And I think they do maybe have a service on Friday. We never went to that Saturday morning. They would have a church service for about two hours. Uh, we didn't go to that one either. Our family didn't go because I don't know. We just didn't want to. <laughs> um, but Saturday evening from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. was the communion service. So it's four hours. And the kids had to be there the whole time and we weren't members. So we weren't participating. We just had to go sit in the back corner in a bench and just be quiet. Wow. And That's a long it. time yeah. to expect kids to kind of yes. just sit around, not, not, not blowing off any steam. It is yes. It, <laughs> very much. So I, as we were raised, I mean, there was no children's church. So we would sit for two hour services every Sunday morning on a hard wooden bench oh, being gosh. quiet. Um, I remember so we, those types of benches yeah. from assemblies in school and even 15 minutes on one of those is not nice. Well, there were a lot of times we got w taken out behind the car out in the parking lot, got spankings because, you know, we were acting up in church, you mm -hmm. know, it's very, very much sit down, be quiet, be respectful. Um, but so we were well-trained, I guess, for this four hour service. And my grandma is awesome. She would make, um, these like, she called them like communion goodie bags or something. And there'd be gum and candy and notepads and Aww. pens and maybe like a little toy. And so she, she was really, really great. And you know, that that's part of what made, I think communion weekend mm -hmm. a good memory for me as well. But the, there's a lot of rituals here. Um, so the men and women are always separated, even on Sunday church, women sit on one side, men sit on the other side, same for communion. Women are upstairs, men are downstairs in the church building. And they just, you know, there's a lot of talking about what these rituals are. So one thing they do is they eat the last supper together as Jesus and the disciples did in the room. So they, they break bread. They have a special bread called communion bread that they make out of flour and butter. And they would uh, eat like beef, so boiled beef. And then um, there's a soup made with the beef stock. And then you would cut loaves of bread into squares and then put it in there. And I called it soggy bread soup. I don't know what it was actually <laughs> called, but it's yeah, just like yeah. you use the spoon to like eat this soggy sopped up bread in beef broth. And it sounds <laughs> disgusting. And, you know, the texture is not great, but it, it was awesome. I loved it growing up. But so you would do that. You would eat together and kind of a solemn meal. And um, that took a while. And then they would do the wine first. And so each member would have this, the cup. 
and they would turn to the member beside them and say like, this is the blood of Christ, which was shed for us for the remission of our sins or something along those lines. They'd have a, a mantra and the other person would say, yes, it is. And then they would take the cup, take a sip, say that to the next member. Now imagine okay, one I cup see, yeah. going around like 200 or 150 members and they're yeah. each saying the same thing to each other. It took, you know, 30 minutes just to get the wine all the way through. Uh, and then they would do it with the bread. So they would take a piece of bread and break it wow, off. This is okay. the bread. This is the body of Christ, which was broken for us. And then, yes, it is. And they pass it on and eat the bread. Um, and then, so that took a, yeah, another half an hour while they're preaching or singing during this time and a lot of hymns. And then uh, they do feet washing. So the members take turns washing each other's feet. So they take their socks off, their shoes off. They've got bowls of water and towels and they're, clearing out benches and moving tables and, you know, one, one person will go down the line and wash feet. And I'm sure they have a mantra, you know, this is, we wash each other's feet in remembrance of Christ or something like that. And um, so it's very humbling, right? It's, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of room for pride in the German Baptist community. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing where it's like, Hey, I'm no better than you. Jesus Mm -hmm. was showing his disciples. He was no better than them. And he wanted to show you how to be a servant. So we're remembering that. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's all done. Then they would pass the holy kiss. <laughs> so we're back to the weirdness. Um, each member would do another mantra about why we greet each other with the holy kiss as commanded in scriptures or something. And so they would just kiss the member beside them. And then the guy would say the same thing to the guy beside him. And so they would pass the holy kiss all the way through the group. It was really, really weird talking about it now. <laughs> It's like somewhere in Second Corinthians, I think it says the Holy Kiss, but yeah. It's, it's, it's strange because I know that this is a very sacred practice in a, mm-hmm. a very much uh, practiced religious group, but it, it almost reminds me of like a college drinking game. Like, like you know, where you, like <laughs> there's this thing that, that, that people used to do where you would put like a playing card between your lips and you had to like, suck on the card to stop it from dropping and you had to pass it to the person next to you and you had to like get this playing card all the way around the circle without dropping it and if it dropped you had to kiss the person who dropped the playing card like and I'd never seen this before and I remember going to uh, an American house party and they were playing this card game and I was like what is going on why are people just passing like a playing card from person to person and I know that a college drinking party or university drinking party is absolutely nothing like a holy religious practice that's just a vision that popped into my mind when you're talking about a group of people sitting around a table passing around this holy kiss um it's uh it's it it does paint quite a picture really and it again I mean it's just it's it's strange what what age are you expected to start participating in the holy kiss is it is it once you're baptized or is it once you are of a certain age yeah you have to be a baptized member um to participate in any of the communion or love feast stuff so us kids were not doing any of it I mean they would you know slip you up some bread to keep you happy or something but for the most part you weren't even eating the um last supper portion. Um, so sometimes you would like have brought some food out in your car. So you slip out and go eat some food mm-hmm. and come back. Um, but you know, like I said, when you, when are you expected between 13 to 18 is when you kind of are expected to have made a decision because you're of the age of reason and are expected to join the church and be a Christian, <laughs> be a German Baptist. So you might um, be like 13 and have be included in this holy kiss? Yes. Oh, that's strange. And oh. and also drinking and also drinking the wine, which again is just a sip, you know, and <laughs> like if, if you're sitting next to like somebody that's a lot older, like and related or not related, I don't even know. What if you're sitting next to your deacon and he's like 60 years old and he's gonna be like, here's a kiss. And you're like 15. I don't know. It's just strange. It's it yep, is it strange it though? Are there, and people might be listening. Is it strange? Like, it's yes. It's not that yes. strange. It, it is strange. No, it's isn't it? it is very strange. I mean, when you grew up in it, no, it's not. I remember taking 
um, a friend from school because I went to a non-German Baptist school, although it was Mennonite. I mean, it was founded by Mennonites, but I took a friend who had no idea of any of this stuff uh, to church. And he's like, he, I didn't, I think I forgot to tell him about the kissing. And he's like, oh my God, dude, there's two dudes just kissed in front of me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about that. And then we also like, anytime you pray during a church service, you um, get on your knees. So everyone gets off the bench, turns around uh, and puts their elbows on the bench and they're on their knees during prayer. Mm. Um, and uh, he didn't know that either. So he's like freaking out, like everyone moves all at the same time and he didn't know what was happening. Yeah, I can imagine that that's quite unsettling when that happens, like almost like there's no cue or anything. It just kind of happens spontaneously out of yep. nowhere. Uh, yeah, I can imagine yep. that that's uh, very strange. Um, there is a couple, there is a little more about communion. So that's Saturday night, obviously, then you're all done the four hours. I mean, there's a lot going on. And then the next Sunday they have like a really early service our family, usually we would have like breakfast at home with all the families. So we didn't really mm -hmm. go to that one either. We weren't very good German Baptists, I guess. Uh, and then Sunday church is like two, two and a half hours. And usually there's so many people, the whole upstairs is filled. The downstairs is filled. Sometimes they've had to like sit outside and stuff. Um, and after that, uh, right at the end of that, the, um, they'll get all the kids lined up and the kids go through the sanctuary and the head elder is breaking off communion bread and giving it to the kids, talking to them. I don't know if this is kind of a way to get the kids like used to like right, why yeah. we celebrate communion, you know, Jesus death and resurrection and his broken body. And so uh, that's, I don't know if that was just our district. It seemed like other districts did the same thing. Um, and so everyone's singing hymns while the kids are walking through getting communion bread uh, which, you know, it was always fun. We always liked that because we liked the bread. And then we would have a meal. Um, and usually there were so many people that we had to have it in two sittings. And it was always the same thing. It was boiled beef, that soggy bread soup, um, like apple butter, which is kind of like, a, um, it's just like a spread to put on the bread. Um, right. Pickles, beets, um, pie. And uh, so we would always eat together on our, big eating hall in the basement. Um, and then there might be some other, like there was a youth group thing. They called it young folks because they're old and like to call things weird stuff. <laughs> so they called it young folks. It's probably named by some old dude. Uh, and so they would get together and play volleyball and hang out. And Sunday was kind of the, the leaving day. Everyone would head home Sunday or Monday. So it was a really involved weekend of just community and traditions and eating. And do you think that communion has uh, abstained for a couple of years whilst the pandemic's unfolded? I don't think so. Um, I, I think initially when the pandemic hit, they did um, stay home for a few Sundays. Um, I think for the most part, they have just done church as normal. Right. Doesn't really matter yeah. to them. The Lord has our days numbered. It's not political for them. They don't care about um, being asked to wear a mask. I think some of the younger yeah. members might be more political, but as a group, they don't really care. Like, okay, so the governor of our state said you have to wear masks. Well, doesn't matter. He has no he has no real authority. Right. Over I, us I see. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I guess my mind it, went straight to COVID when you talked about the kiss being passed the kissing, around yeah. and the wine yep. being passed around and everyone kind of drinking from the same from the same thing so, and, and, and to me I'm thinking straight away like oh I don't know about that these days well I mean every Sunday you know as they're greeting each other before they head into church they're all kissing and shaking hands and mm. you know all that so it's happening every Sunday um communion is a minuscule part of spreading COVID <laughs> for this group I suppose so. uh, yeah I, yeah I know they would probably stay home if they're feeling sick I mean they're not intentionally just jerks they do believe that covid's a real disease and it's killing people and mm -hmm. so they they would stay home if they're sick but um and i know covid has affected quite a few members of the group um i don't i can't think of anyone who's died but i i haven't really been a part mm -hmm. of the group for a while mm -hmm. so i guess i i don't know and you you've spoken briefly about the expectations of sort of um appearance outward appearance 
uh, with mm-hmm. things like w- how women are expected to dress with the um the headdresses and you also mentioned in your writing to me that men ha- have to have beards uh, if they're a deacon or an elder they have to have a beard what no if you're cash. like one of these guys that just can't can't grow a beard and you've got a scraggly crappy looking beard <laughs> You see some guys who, you know, they think it's biblical to grow a beard and uh, it's just patch, you know, it's, it's, we call them uh, wild west beards because there are lots of wide open spaces. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, and so they'll also some trim, like if they care more about hygiene, but the older, more conservative ones would not trim the beard at all. And so some of our jokes you know, when we were younger, it's like, how many buttons is your beard? So like buttons of the vest that they wear. So it's like, right. okay, if you've got a two button beard, that's down to like <laughs> below your nipples. If you've got a four button beard, that's down to your waist. How many buttons uh, is your beard? I like that. <laughs> yep. yep. And, uh, and no mustache. Now I think that's because uh, the mustache back way back when was like a, a, a stylish thing where men would like wax them and mm-hmm. curl them and stuff. And so they did not want stylishness. And so no mustache are allowed. Um, and I think part of the stylish thing is also like in the way they dress, you know, obviously no flashy colors. They don't want the women to wear dresses that are gaudy or like bright red or bright pink. They cannot wear stuff like that. It's very plain muted colors. No, mm-hmm. not a lot of patterns. Um, the men, when they wear pants, they're called broad falls because they do not have zippers. Why? Uh, I don't know. There's some rule in the rule book called, uh, it's called the minute book. Some rule somewhere that's like no zippers. And so you wear pants that um, they button down and then they have a flap in the front so that the buttoned area is covered. So I don't know if you can look at Broad Falls and... um, That sounds really interesting. I I, I think I'd heard something about the Amish community not not wearing, not having zips on their clothes. Yep. I remember thinking when when it had first been put to me that the Amish community don't use zips, I remember thinking, how are zips like like technology? Because in my mind, years ago, I was thinking, all I know about (laughs) Amish people is that they don't believe in technology, but how are zips anything to do with like mobile phones and, and... and computers and things like that. I mean, it's like with any group, it's not just German Baptists or Christians or evangelicals or um, Jew, you know, Orthodox Jews or Jehovah's Witness. Everyone picks and chooses what they think is acceptable and not. And a lot of times there's not consistency in that. Like with evangelical Christianity, um, there is no consistency with what they pick and choose out of scripture you know, to hold fast on each group picks and chooses their own things. And the German Baptist and Amish are uh, every bit as guilty, you know, no zippers, but we'll have eyeglasses and we'll have, you know, cars and electricity. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, they're very good points. Yeah. Very, very, very good ways of explaining things away. Uh, Very rational questions are uh, are easily explained away. I've just looked up these broad fold pants and I can I see exactly what you're talking about here with the little flap, which is uh, interesting. I I think the flap is to cover the the opening where like the the buttons go, like where the zipper traditionally would be, because it might be immodest in case that opens up or something. Mm -hmm. And so that flap covers it um, for women they'll the the dress so if if you're listening to this and can google it google um old german baptist brethren and you'll see the woman's dress has a cape covering their shoulders back and breasts and it's because the dress isn't necessarily super loose and so there is the outline of the breasts and that might be too sexual or something maybe and so they wear a cape that's sewn onto the dress that kind of covers that almost I don't want to compare it to a burqa, not a burqa, but maybe a hijab or something on no, Muslim women. If anybody's watched The that Handmaid's is, Tale, it's kind of like, um, yeah, like yep, I mean, yep. it's not, they're not in the color red, like yeah, they red are is in too, The Handmaid's Tale. Um, they body, are those yeah. muted colors, like you mentioned before, kind of like pastel pinks and greens and beiges and browns. But absolutely, like if you can picture what they wear in The Handmaid's Tale, bonnets included, um, that's that's kind of what this this dress wear looks like mm-hmm. here. That's yep. uh, 
very very interesting and i'm just seeing here a picture of two men talking one has a beard with no moustache and one has no facial hair so there i recognize straight yeah. away that one of those men is in a position of power <laughs> well so it's very much up to i think i'm even looking at the same picture you are so it's up to the the man right so the one on the right is not a deacon or elder for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the one on the left probably isn't either it's just the style right um it, if you went to go be a deacon or elder though you would be required to have grown up here that's so funny that's so funny because my partner's got a friend who just does not have he, he just doesn't he leaves his face for weeks and weeks and he might have like two or three bristles on his you know chin or on his cheeks there's there's no defining facial hair whatsoever and i just can't imagine like the pressure some men must feel trying to grow one of these really mm -hmm. like long impressive looking beards that kind of go like a ball beard like imagine if you saw someone's ball beard and thought i can't even have a one beard yeah i mean it's as much as it's not about outward appearance, which is why they wear the plain uniform and all this stuff, it very much is because it's you're supposed to be in the world, but not of it, not conform to the world and wear what they wear yet. And, and the whole purpose was so that you don't stand out. You, you just, you know, you're not bringing attention on yourself right? Uh, because you want to be humble. And there's a sense of pride in that because as you walk through town, you're getting stared at. You are bringing attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. prideful on, look how pious I am by wearing these broad falls and these dresses with capes. Yeah. And yeah. look at look at my beard and my black hat. I'm different than you. I am a part of something better. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, they're almost hypocritical about the purpose of why they dress the way they are. And I, of course, I don't want to put a blanket statement on everyone because there are. Not everyone has that. You could not, you couldn't be a member and not dress like that. Let's put it that way. No. So there was something you mentioned towards the start of the episode. And I want to make sure that I go back through and, and kind of gather all the information on some of these things that you've mentioned and said that we could go into more detail on. And one of those is the fact that you now work in IT, but technology was something that was uh, very much put to you that you should avoid and uh, should should not kind of be involved in so it how is how is technology a restriction within the the church itself like how is it how is it put to you when you're growing up that, that it's something you should stay away from you know the the church's relationship with technology is interesting because in newer church buildings that get built, they'll put a speaker system in because maybe they need to have people in the basement and they need to be able to hear. So they'll have a, a microphone and speakers. Um, obviously, no music gets played over it, but uh, we want everyone to hear. They'll have uh, actually you can call in like to their annual meetings, uh, which happen once a year. You can call in a hotline and listen to what's being said. So they broadcast what they're doing. The new, the new conference has a website. Um, the old conference says no internet whatsoever. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting. Like we grew up, no TV in our house. Uh, you don't watch movies. No one's allowed to watch movies. Uh, even the radio isn't really allowed. Um, we, we always kept a radio in our car, but um, other people in the church would take the radio out of the vehicle. So buy a brand new vehicle and pull the radio out immediately. And that's it. My grandparents always covered it. So my grandpa made like a special cover that he could Velcro on and cover the radio. Um, and, you know, I, the thing about technology it kind of pulls into media. So, you know, I'll get back to why, how I got into IT and what that looks like, but um, there are, kids who would go around and look in people's cars and see who still has a radio in their car, like during church, like peek in, okay, these people have a radio. They're obviously not good. You know, why do they have a radio? Well, we don't listen to it. Well, it doesn't matter. You should have that radio out. Um, if you get caught watching movies, um, you're in trouble. So my parents had watched a movie or something. This was quite a while ago. I don't 
don't know if I was born or not at that point. I don't think I was. Um, but they were talking about it or somebody heard it and found out and uh, told the elders. And so they had to stand up in front of the congregation and apologize, you know, and repent of the sin of watching a movie. And other members have had to do similar things. I think they've chilled out a little bit on it, maybe in the new conference. Um, but, you know, that's that's not something you do. Um, you know, we would we would watch movies like if my my grandparents on my mom's side were not German Baptist and they would have a TV so we could kind of watch movies. But it was very rare um, listening to the radio. We would, when driving around, usually just local Christian stations or like um, other Christians who grew up in America might uh, recognize Adventures in the Odyssey, uh, Adventures in Odyssey, which was a Christian program for kids where they would like talk, I don't know, it's just a Christian thing. So we would listen to that on our way home from school. Uh, we were a more progressive family, I would say, in the community. Um very at odds with the conservative members of the community. Um, so aside from the media, like you're not even reading like secular comics or right. books, right? You would not read fiction, non-Christian fiction or secular fiction. Uh, that would be too vain. It's just not a, that's a waste of time. You should be reading scripture or mm -hmm. they had a publication called the Vindicator that people would get and we should read that or, you know, something that's uplifting, not something that's um, secular or vain or for your own enjoyment. Right. It's, it's not uplifting. It's not good. So then when it comes to it, um, you know, businessmen would have computers. They've got the internet uh, to run their business. You, most homes would have computers. They, they would embrace technology to some extent. Yep. So it was never like, Oh, you can't go be on a computer. We always had a computer at the home. Um, it's just technology is not something we want to trust or, or focus on, right? You would never see a, a techie, you know, with the latest iPhones and he's got yeah, the smart yeah. home and, and all that stuff. That's just not the style. I mean, there may be one or two, but for the most part, uh, you just don't, you don't trust it. You don't need it. You don't want it. You just kind of live a plain life. Uh, and I know there's, you know, if there are extra Baptist or current German Baptists who are listening to this, they're probably going, what are you talking about? We embrace all sorts of technology. Yes. But think about some of the more plain or old conference members, you know, that's, that's the bulk of the German Baptist church and they don't embrace it. Um, and that's part of why that split in 2009 between old conference and new conference was because of the internet. So they, they say it's not and the, the letter that was written where you sign and say, I'm leaving the church and starting this other one um, said, basically the church is kind of the final authority on rules, right? So here's the rules. You either submit to the church or you don't, and we're kicking you out. And part of that was the internet, whether or not members should use the internet. So the new, the old conference members, do not use the internet, or if they do, right. they have a very special program called a private garden or a walled garden. And basically it's a company that installs software on your computers that you cannot get to the internet and you can like get emails in, but they monitor them or something. So wow. it's very, very okay. limited. And the church, the old conference split again. And within the past year over that, they don't even want that level of internet access, okay. which is basically nil, but they don't even want that and they split again. <laughs> and do you think that comes from sort of uh, pushing technology away or fear of people using the internet as a research tool to look into kind of? I think, you know, a lot of it is like, okay, so what are you going to do on the internet? There's all sorts of bad things. You know, there's atheist material that's going to pull you away and just tear down your faith. There's um, pornography that we, you know, we do not want men to be dragged into that because it's an epidemic that's you know, taken over all these other churches. We're just not even going to make that an option. Um, you know, just, you can watch movies or YouTube videos that are um, not edifying, not pleasing to the Lord. And, you know, so 
since you have this portal to all this crap, yes, it can be good, but it's mainly crap, so we just don't want it. And the new conference is like, well, we all, you know, it's individual. We need to make our choices to, you know, not participate in those things. Because even if you don't have the internet, you can still go be a bad person and, you know, make bad choices. So, you know, just you make your own choices. You make your own good choices and be accountable. And um, if that makes sense. It's it's just that interesting, and and it's interesting as well that people are positioning themselves and saying, you know, the church is the ultimate authority. But there is, you know, you, you can follow the New Testament, but it's still a very old text, and there's nobody on this plane who can give the correct answers around whether we should use technology or the internet and, th- and things like that. So it's, it's, it is interesting because should the movements be progressive and move forward with technology so they stay relevant in this day and age, or should they stick true to the biblical texts that they, that they practice and worship to stay mm-hmm. as, as true to the faith as possible? It's another one of those, interesting questions to ponder on a deeper level um and it's probably one that is argued within this particular group quite often especially when people go out and buy a brand new car or vehicle and take the radio out that is such a (laughs) bizarre notion to me because buying a new vehicle comes with technology in itself in this day and age you know a lot of cars are basically run on computers that have diagnostic tools inside them where you take it to a garage and the mechanic plugs something into the car and the computer will tell him where the fault in the car is so there's kind of that level of technology but you'll take the sound system out of the car because you're not allowed to listen to music or the radio so that in itself is a very interesting thing to consider um mm-hmm. but even and, and they take the radio out of tractors too so it, by and large the german baptists are based in rural areas and so, so they're farmers agriculture you know that's that's how i grew up and um so with that comes a lot of driving and tractors well the old school old order you know type german baptists they'll take the radios out of the tractors and i have spent many an hour in my youth sitting in a tractor wondering like how in the world you could sit there for that long with no radio that would just be mind numbing you know and i think they're you know the idea is well just sing sing and make uh, hymns in your heart to the lord or whatever that phrase is and talk to god and you know just focus on scripture and everything else it's like for like 14 hours straight yeah Um, yeah it is when you when you say it like that like i'm thinking oh what would i do for 14 hours like usually i'd be doing like social media posts on my phone or you know replying to emails um and then i'm like okay if i don't have my phone what do i do oh i'll pick up a book oh but i'm not i can't read anything so i can't do that okay so i'm driving in my car and i don't have my music and i don't have like a podcast or an audio book and i'm like like what what would I do for 14 hours if I didn't have like, can't do a crossword, I guess, because I don't probably don't know enough about pop culture and secular things to be able to participate in a crossword. It's so then I'm thinking, I don't even know. I don't even know what my go-to would be if I'm just, I'd be at a loss, absolutely at a loss. <laughs> well, you're sitting in a tractor, so you can't really write crossword puzzles i mean you're mm-hmm, steering and mm-hmm, stuff mm-hmm. so like for me it'd be like podcasts or music or something yeah, like that yeah. uh for for the more conservative members it'd just be a lot of silence and i think you would start to go crazy a little bit but it's uh, i do remember one time with with a member we were driving to the airport and they didn't have a radio in their car and stuff this was with a friend of mine and so it's the middle of the night we're like catching a real early flight and we're driving to the airport and um the person in the front is singing hymns and uh in the car the whole way and it's like you know so that's probably what they do just sing to themselves or i think if i was left alone with my own thoughts for that amount of time i think that'd be quite dangerous um 
<laughs> yes, yes I, I would say uh, so. But then again, I we're used to having all the access to this technology. So perhaps if you'd never had it, you would know how to deal better mm-hmm. in that particular situation. It's another one of those things that I always try and think about both sides and try and kind of position myself mm-hmm. in, 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 in both situations. So, yeah, I, 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 I realise I am the type of person that leans heavily on my technology, but if I'd never had access to it and didn't, have it Didn't as know what you're yeah absolutely so at what point did you finally decide to leave the church and what did that look like conversations with your family preparations to kind of not go back what 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 was that like for you um I wasn't a full-on member mm-hmm. so my experience in leaving was a little bit different my sister was and so were my parents and so I've got plenty of stories from their perspective on what that's like right um I knew yeah. as a young person like my idea of what it was to be a Christian was um to grow a beard to wear a black hat to yeah. farm yeah. and to take your wife and kids to church right. and read read the King James Bible because they only read the King James Version Uh, They're King James only, which has lots of other problems with how you interpret scripture. But anyways, um, that was my idea of what it was to be a Christian. And I remember as a young kid thinking, I want no part of this. Uh, It's too boring. And if it's the only truth, I don't care. Um, I got a spanking for saying that to my parents, saying I'm never going to get baptized and be a German Baptist when I was like six or something. I I, I remember that. Um, probably cause they, I don't know my parents just weren't really hearing what I was saying or what it was, but, um, so growing up church services on Sundays were boring. I kind of had like <laughs> ADHD a little bit. I'm very hyperactive. My brain's always going a million miles an hour. So to sit for two hours on a hard bench, listening to some old dude with a white beard, you know, drone on and on about who Things knows what. A no, very long you know, time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Well, just, just, you know, it's like the concepts were over my head as a kid. I, you know, you're not in children's church. You're not hearing Bible stories. You're just listening to an old guy say words. And it was very boring. I hated it. I hated church, dreaded going to church. I would mm-hmm, pass mm-hmm. the time by like picking certain items in the room to count like blades on the fans up there. How many blades of fans are there? Just bored as I'll get out. Um, mm-hmm. So I always knew I wanted to leave. I just didn't have a way out. Uh, my sister was a baptized member and she started dating somebody who was not a member. Okay. And so I think they'd, they'd agreed that like he wasn't going to join. And uh, so she's like, well, it's fine. I'll leave. Mm-hmm. So she ended up leaving at about 18, I think. Um, and I was 15. And so she started going to an, uh, an evangelical conservative evangelical church in our same town. And I'm like, whatever. First, take it out of here. I'm with her. I'm going. Yeah. I think my parents just realized like they can't keep me in. Um, you know, they would try and like ground me by yeah. sending me to the youth, the, the German Baptist youth group. Okay. I didn't want to go. And so they, they didn't ground me by keeping me from it. They'd say, no, you're forced to go and uh, be with them. <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, the worst. So, um, I, uh, I left with my sister started going to these other churches. Uh, and I, I had been in a very, very, very conservative politically evangelical church for, um, probably 10 or 11, 12 years until I recently left at the beginning of COVID. Wow. Um, that's a, that's a whole nother story. Wow. I didn't even pod- realize Jordan that there was like a second thing that there oh, yeah, was. The, the, oh my goodness. Wow. I got a, I got a second half. Yes. So it was very, very, very like Trump is our savior type of church COVID. Like, no, what are you talking about? Jordan, we need, we I didn't need to be know back this. That would have been fascinating to discuss. Yeah. There's definitely a lot about that, you know, and I, wow. I'm sure you've heard a lot about deconstruction of American evangelicals mm, and a lot of yes. people are leaving the faith because of Republicans, Trump, COVID and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's like a certain whole Christian's yeah. reaction. Yeah. So that is me. I'm a part of that. <laughs> uh, so the German Baptist is very different because it's not 
like Trump, Republicans, conservatism. Mm-hmm. That's just, they don't want to be a part of politics. We're outside of it. Uh, right. The other church I was at was very much like, you know, as Trump started coming on, we were preaching like Republicanism from the pulpit and wow. very, very much end times oriented. Like Jesus is coming back like tomorrow, like apocalypse is happening kind of. Yeah. Anyways, I don't want to wow. get off track. I'm sorry. Um, so as my sister left, the the interesting thing is what happened to her. She had friends in the church that, I mean, just flipped. And it was like, you know, when you're in, we're friends, we're good, you're Aww. saved, you're happy. When you're telling me you're leaving now, well, I had a friend of my sister's who was like, the only reason he told me this, you know, your sister's leaving and all this. Yeah, okay. The only reason she wants to leave is because she wants to wear pants. She wants to get her ears pierced, wear makeup, and you guys want to go um, to rock concerts every Sunday. Because that's what they viewed, like a worship band on the stage, right? With bars and stuff. And, you're, you're going to a rock and concert. What, you just wanna... So what if those are the things that she wants to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like you just you're leaving because you want to go live in sin, right? Like you're going to this conservative church, oh, that's gosh. Christian, but you you want to go live in your sin and do what you want. Like you you don't value our beliefs anymore. And you know, there's my mom because my my parents also left a couple of years after that. Right. And, you know, some of the way that ways uh, my mom lost friends, I mean, just straight up, like that's you're, you are pulling yourself out of a community where you leave You're we're, we're not friends anymore. That's, I hate hearing um, about these stories where friendships and yeah. love is conditional. It's, it's, it's ha- mm-hmm. heartbreaking. Yeah. It's not like a shunning, uh, like the Amish do or Jehovah's Witness where it's extreme. Uh, it's more. Um, it, it feels like it's like not, not a forced shunning, but a decisive one on the part of people who remain in the religious group that you're leaving. It's like they just dis- almost decide to shun you, even though it's not enforced. It, you know, as a German Baptist, all of your activities are German Baptist related. So, okay, we're having a singing, right? We're getting together and we're singing for hours and worshiping and doing yeah. all this stuff. Um, you're no longer a German Baptist, but you can't come to the singing is my guess. I would assume I don't, I don't ever remember any non-German Baptists going. So you cannot participate. Now I'm sure, and I know my parents still have lots of friends in the German Baptist church. I, um, I guess I'm still acquaintances with some people there. Uh, most of my friends have left or are not members. Um, but there are people that are good friends that my mom has still been with and, and, or my dad or whatever. And, you know, they do business with, or they go to dinners with. And, uh, but for the most part, most of my parents, good friends who were apart have also left. And so that's kind of made it a little easier. They had to deal with that. You're in and I'm not mentality. Yeah. 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 So that's probably helped some of the, the other ones who were like, well, we're not friends anymore. Well, my mom can tell, you know, another hour or two's worth of stories on what it was like. I to imagine, leave and what, yeah, you know, I imagine that your 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 mom and your dad have those stories. Do you feel like they that mm-hmm. they, as you and your sister told them that you decided to leave, and you know they tried to kind of get you to go to the the what young folks group? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that that your dad especially felt a level of pressure to keep you in? the in the fold because so much of your family history is intertwined with this particular group um I don't think my dad cares as much about the family history um you know I I don't know if part of that was because his dad died when he was very young right um and maybe that was traumatic for him my uh, my grandpa fell off a roof and was in a coma for seven years, oh six or goodness. seven years. Oh my goodness. Um, and they cared for like my, my grandma, his wife and, uh, my great grandma, my grandpa's mom, uh, cared for him in the coma for seven years. And that's how my dad knew his dad growing up was a vegetable laying in a bed oh in the living my room. Goodness. And, you know, so I don't know if there was trauma there with family history and stuff. I, I don't know. I haven't really, talk to my dad about it right. but he does, hasn't seemed to you know the the lineage you know our, our last name and our lineage and our german baptist history doesn't 
okay. really matter to him. Now, my, yeah. my dad's older brother, my uncle, he is very obsessed with our family lineage and history, and he's an uh, old conference, German Baptist. Um, and this is so, a family like the family member that's plain. gone through and plotted the family tree and the history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. okay. So, you know, I, maybe there's a correlation between his interest in our family lineage and that matters to him and my dad not caring as much, maybe. Uh, my dad's always been a little bit of a rebel. And so, uh, you know, growing up, I don't know if just kind of growing up without a father figure in the home for a really long time, because my grandma didn't end up remarrying until my dad was uh, an older teenager. Okay. So he didn't really have that father figure growing up and kind of was just rebellious. And um, he, my dad never grew a beard. He didn't wear a black hat. He kept the radios in the vehicles. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he wasn't a a real good German Baptist, I would say. Um, funny enough, you know, it's like, and I think that's part of why it, it was easier for me to leave. It wasn't like, well, I had to just say, screw you family. I'm out of here. I'm running off. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just yeah. like, Hey, I, I'm going to this other church with my sister. Okay, fine. We can't keep you in. Mm-hmm, Who cares? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. And my, my mom, you know, I think what was hardest for her, like my dad, it was not hard for him to leave. Um, I wouldn't say, but for my mom, uh, she left, she didn't really have friends. I mean, she was a teenager in high school, you know, rebellious teenager. And she yeah. met my dad and fell in love and converted and got baptized. And this was her life. Now her family, her community, all mm-hmm. of her friends, everything. My, they shortly after they got married, they also moved a couple States away to start farming in the state that we're in. And, uh, there was a small, actually, they came up and started with a couple other families, the German Baptist um, district here in our town. So they were in the beginnings in the 80s, like when it started here in this town. Mm-hmm. And um, so they were, I mean, they, it was like not just the insular German Baptist community. It was like we're in a brand new area where we know nobody. We have nothing. Wow. We're trying to farm. And we came up with two or three other families starting this German Baptist community. So that just like intensified the isolation mm-hmm. and the friendships that my mom made with those other women and, and those yeah. groups. So to then, you know, 20, 30, some years, you know, 20-ish, some years later to leave, uh, that's, you know, that, that's even harder on so many other levels, I would say. Mm-hmm. For, mm-hmm. For her. Yeah, yeah. Especially if, like you mentioned earlier on in the episode, she maybe feels like she was never fully accepted in the first place to have that kind of uphill battle and then the big transition of then leaving the church after all of, all of that it's it, it in itself must be a whirlwind she was accepted by um some of the members so you know there's kind of a dichotomy and and that came out in the split when it, where my parents left uh the older the old conference members they were never family friends. Like, you know, it, it was almost like the church was honestly split well before it actually split based right. on the, mm-hmm. the old conference, new conference. Like you kind of fell into one of two groups and we were never really friends with the ones from the old conference anyways, because we just had different values. And oddly enough, those values are things like whether you wear a sweater over or under your cape of your dress or you know, whether you wear broad falls or whether you, um, uh, Bible studies, for instance. So, uh, the old conference believed you should not have Bible studies in your home. Uh, Bible, the Bible should only be studied by these elected elders on Sundays. And if you are studying the Bible in your home individually, you know, as a small group, uh, that's an opportunity for Satan to come in with, uh, doctrine that is not legitimate. Right. And so they were fundamentally against it and it was like i remember that being a big problem when i was attending a german baptist bible study some old conference members are like you know i I was shocked to hear it was like wait you don't approve of people studying the bible in their home in a group like wait what yeah yeah (laughs) yeah so she was accepted by the the new conference style members and that's who we hung out with the old conference style you know we never really Right, right. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, one of my next questions, well, one of the last questions, really, before I ask you what advice you have for others who 
may be in similar groups and and looking to leave <laughs> is actually like what has your life been like since and I feel like that's a redundant question because you've got years of being involved in this other group which is like a whole other thing like a whole oh, other two you. three yeah. hour episode um <laughs> so yeah are you free of religion at the moment are you involved in another religious group where do where does your faith lie currently uh yeah so i mean since i've been out it's it's been a while i mean i've like i said I, one of my best friends was a member for a long time and so i always stayed in touch with him and knew what was going on um he's since left and i've kind of helped him through that process because his his dad is uh, an elder in the church and his whole family is staunchly German Baptist. So, you know, other, other friends and acquaintances have left. And so in these past 10 years, while I've attended these other churches, I have still been kind of connected in a way. My grandma, uh, grandparents are still members and still attend. Uh, but the rest of my aunts and uncles, for the most part, except for the one I mentioned, uh, they're, they're out. Um, I think when I was leaving, I was just trying to get out. I didn't care what it was. Um, and I ended up at a very conservative evangelical church because it was the closest to what I knew. Right. It, it was, you know, they call themselves non-denominational, but really that's just because they painted over the Baptist sign on their, on okay. the outside of it. Um, and, you know, I, I liked it because it was different. They, they preached the Bible and the new King James version. So it was like, Oh, this is refreshing. I don't have to hear all these these and thous. Um, and you know, I made a community there. I met my wife there. Um, we had two kids while attending. And and then COVID hit, and my wife has an autoimmune uh, disorder. Okay. And so we were taking things very seriously at the beginning because we just didn't know. We didn't want to risk it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My my immediate family took the opposite train of thought, which, you know, that hurt a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, I can imagine for your wife, yeah. that must've been quite difficult as well to feel like mm-hmm. her health was not being taken seriously at that point. Yep. Yep. And, and the church was, you know, making news as one of the first churches in our area after some of the mandates, you know, stay at home kind of a thing. Uh, they were, holding church services again on the news saying, you know, right. we're, we don't care. We're, we're getting people. We're not going to be afraid of this virus. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. We, we have need to meet together. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And they, ever since, I mean, they've just doubled down into conspiracy theories and, you know, the, the right wing, like Scandal the January 6th movie. insurrection was like a patriotic thing. I don't want to speak for everybody at this evangelical church, but you know, it's, most of the people in the leadership. And so my wife and I ended up leaving. Uh, I left because of their COVID and politics. My wife mm-hmm. left because she just wanted a smaller church that she liked oh, more. Same um, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and since, since then I've gone through a deconstruction of, you know, my beliefs in biblical literalism um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or fundamentalism, I guess it's, kind of the term and yeah like you said that's another several hour thing of my experiences you know learning young earth creationism and this church bringing in um scientists and i put that in air quotes <laughs> to talk about why carbon dating's stupid and the flood actually happened and the earth's only six thousand years old and don't listen to evolutionists they're yeah like satan trying to lie to you, you know, all that good you know. stuff yeah yeah yep so i've been deconstructing that quite a bit uh, over the past couple of years. And so kind of in a limbo right now, don't really know where to put myself, I guess, still, still trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe you'll never really know where, where you feel (laughs) aligned or where you position yourself. Um, And Mm -hmm. I feel like with spirituality and, and faith, it's, it's a, an ever-changing thing, you know. You, you could have one small experience that changes everything you thought you'd just learn or relearn, I, I guess. So 
Yeah. Um, it's it's one of those things that yeah. that 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 never settles and stays. I I, I don't think um, for, for most sure. people, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Or maybe some people will listen and say, "I know exactly what my beliefs are. And they've never changed, and and I don't think they ever yeah. will." Um, so uh, to be yeah, that, that sure of something, I imagine uh, is uh, yeah. is a pretty great thing, really. Um, well, I'm I mean, that's sure what I guess anything. where the word. That's where the word faith comes in. And I mean, when you say that you're that certain about something, I, I I think that's where some of my trauma, my religious trauma growing up in this, and then also coming out of this other group, um, mm-hmm. you know, the certainty in my beliefs. I, while I was a part of this last church, I, I was certain I, anything you can ask could be answered with scripture. Mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. certain of it. I could find it. I could find the answer. It was in there. And, you know, I realize how stupid that is because um, being so certain, I mean, that's, that's a, a problem. Like we really don't know a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, as a kid growing up German Baptist, I, I remember um, this idea of a vengeful, angry God a little bit where mm-hmm. um, I didn't know if I was saved enough. Right. So I would pray incessantly every night to forgive all the sins I'd name them out. And, you know, and I, the next night I was like, well, what did I forget? I'm sure I forgot something. And I'm going to hell if I don't get this prayer. Oh. So I would like, and there was one sin I felt like was so bad. I prayed every night and I was like, that wasn't good enough. The next night I'd pray for it again. Like I just, it wasn't good enough. And just so afraid of hell and, you know, not being saved. Cause I just wasn't, I wasn't right, you know, and, and if you had some unconfessed, unrepented of sin, you, and you died in that, you would go to hell, Mm -hmm. a literal eternal torment. Um, Because it wasn't maybe a hard line doctrine of German Baptist, but it's kind of the unspoken, like German Baptists are the only ones who have it right. The other progressive churches in town do not, and Mm -hmm. they're going to hell. And that's yeah, terrifying they, uh, imagery to to share with, you know, you said you were 12 years old. Like, I, that must be terrifying to lay in bed and think that all of these awful things are going to happen to you because you're not, you're not doing things the way that they should be done. Yeah. Oh, it is. I think that's uh, definitely where a lot of religious trauma centers around for me is this idea of just slightest slip of the tongue is going to send you to an eternal torment very much like sinners in the hands of an angry god mm-hmm. type uh message and and also rapture so the german baptists do believe in um you know the future coming of second coming of christ and the rapture and you know believers will go unbelievers mm-hmm. will stay there's you know the end judgment so i also um had a fear that since i wasn't right with god you know, or I, I was only right if I prayed, um, the rapture would happen and I would be left. And so there were time, a couple of times I remember, I remember distinctly thinking, I can't find my family. I can't find people. The, all these lights are off. I, the rapture happened and I was left. And the, the dread that came over me, it's like, I, I forgot to pray forgiveness for these sins that I missed and I got left. Yeah, as a young kid, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really sad, isn't it? That's really sad to think about if you yes. had those experiences in a somewhat uh, liberal evangelical household, uh, you know, as you talked about, your father wasn't too hung up on like, you know, the black cat and the radio in the car and things like that. For, for children growing up in the more conservative households that might have this imagery put to them, uh, a bit more regularly or forcefully I, it, it, that maybe there's like a, a a lot of young children out there and, and and young adults out there who are having these worries and fears and living in kind of a state of of like uh, just turmoil really like and, and stress I imagine mm-hmm. um and not well, just with this yeah. group particularly but with others that yeah. use that kind of fire and brimstone imagery as well yeah a lot of a lot of groups do that i mean it's a scare tactic to keep you in line it's i mean 
one of the first things I deconstructed was the idea of hell. And, uh, you know, that was like, wow, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what it helped when, it, you know, if my parents had deconstructed the idea of hell and raised me that way, and I'm going to raise my kids without this fear of hell. And my parents mm-hmm. bought me a book mm-hmm. called 23 minutes in hell. A, a guy wrote a story about how he, God sent him to hell for 23 minutes and he was tortured by demons and all this stuff. Oh, and then God goodness. pulled him out of there and said, okay, this was for you to go like pre- preach and tell people. And my parents bought me this book. It was kind of when I was in a rebellious stage in my teenage years. And, and uh, I think they, they bought it to scare the hell out of me, mm-hmm. pun intended. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, that was traumatizing as well. Cause I believed every word of it. I'm like, like I'm going to get tortured by demons mm. for eternity uh, if I don't get it right. And that's no way to, I mean, that's not a choice. You, you're not making a choice if you, you know, go get baptized into some church because you want to get out of hell. You're just trying yeah. to get your free ticket out of hell. It's so, um, oh, it's so unfortunate. Some of the things that, that come through on this podcast in terms of though that, that religious trauma that's inflicted to people at such a young age. Um, but you talked about mm-hmm. how you deconstructed hell as one of the thir- first things that you did when you moved away from from either group so uh, is that kind of part and parcel of advice that you would give for others who are looking to leave would you say kind of the deconstructing of certain things were important in your initial journey out of out of the evangelical groups that you've been a part of or and what advice would you give on top of that so to the advice for like the German Baptist or the very, very high demand religion, you know, that, that to me was, I don't care if what they believe is true. I just hate it. I'm, I'm out. And I don't want to be part of that. That was part of my rebellion against this. You have to behave and perform a certain way and all that. Um, You know, everyone's leaving experience is different and I don't want to speak for other high demand religions because I know, a Jehovah's Witness has a lot more on the line when they leave than a German Baptist does. German Baptist is just, you lose some, some of your community. Jehovah's Witness, you lose your family, like straight up. They don't yeah. talk to you at all. And that's not how German Baptists are. Um, so they're probably a little less high demand in that regard. But, you know, if you're wanting to leave, just realize, you know, God's not scared of you asking questions or you, trying to seek him in your own way. Um, and nobody else can tell you what your experience has to be with spirituality or with God. And so, I mean, that's, that's kind of on you. Um, and, and don't judge others for wanting to pursue a different path. I think that's a big thing for German current German Baptists is if somebody chooses to leave, there's a lot of judgment towards why do you want to sin? Do you want to, um, you know, just go off and do this thing. Like, you know, so the, don't cast judgment on, on members who do want to leave. Um, as far as like deconstructing hell, that one came as I was leaving the most recent evangelical church. And I think that came because for some reason, I just had this thought about, is it logical that um, if you're born in Pakistan into a Muslim family and the only chance you ever have to hear about Jesus Christ is like some passing comment somebody makes and that was your chance. And then you die and go to hell and you missed your chance. Like, you know, man, it's real lucky that I was born in America in the right denomination out of 35,000. Uh, mm-hmm. And I've got my ticket to, to heaven. We got it right. Finally. This is something I've talked about a lot, like on, on the show. And I always say like, what if I've spoken to somebody that is from the true group or the right group and they've all been told that they are the chosen ones and they are on the correct path, but not everyone can be. So what if there is one group and what if I've spoken to somebody that is, <laughs> right? so it's another one of those things that's like hard to get your, your kind of, head around when you think about them but yeah it's uh you've just well, it's, summed it's it up called, perfectly there when, when you've said it like that yeah it's pascal's wager right like the well if god is true then you're better off believing in him than not i mean you can look up pascal's wager it's not a great 
argument for it, but it, I think it's some of the thoughts people have for belief in God. Um, I know that uh, when you're in the group, it's really hard to look outside and go, hey, let's be critical about my beliefs and, you know, my community and all this stuff. You don't, that hurts. You don't want to do that. It's not an easy process. Um, but if you're open to being like, hey, I might be wrong. Uh, that's, I mean, at that point, it's you have to shut your brain down. You have to st- just try and stop that. I mean, you've got to straight up go into like, I don't even know what, there's probably a psychological term for it. I know there's cognitive dissonance when you, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're you in, but you don't believe that way. Uh, yeah. Cognitive dissonance is when you're open to believing a different way, you just can't leave and it sucks. Uh, yeah. When you open yourself to saying, hey, I might be wrong. That's when you can deconstruct these ideas of hell or being a part of a high demand religion. And, um, you know, for me, I, I just, it took that logical, like, well, it's not fair. Like if I believe in God and he's all good and all this and all that, then it's really not fair for somebody to be born as a Muslim, have one tiny little chance and then go to hell for eternity and be Mm -hmm. tormented. Um, And so I was like, well, what do I really believe about it? And I picked up a book by Bart Ehrman called heaven and hell. He's a new Testament scholar. used to be a Christian until he studied the Bible (laughs) in the original Greek. And, um, And he just kind of goes through what people actually believed about it. And, you know, when you base your theology on the 1600s version of King James translation, and it's got problems, you're going to believe things that are not true Mm -hmm. about hell or about, you know, maybe women being preachers in church or certain things. They're they're just not something you need to base everything on. And, uh, that's kind of what it was for me. It's like, okay, well, if, if we're mistranslating this or we're misunderstanding it, what else is there? And then evolution and, you know, other things come in and little pieces of the puzzle start getting filled Mm -hmm. together. Now Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, that's too much at once. And, um, you know, so I don't know if it's kind of a chicken before the egg, um, saying where it's like, okay, in a high demand religion, like Christian, style high demand religions, the Bible is literal, it is infallible, and it is perfect. Evangelicals believe that, and so do, typically so do, um, high demand religions. Mormons believe it, as along with some other books, but if you're outside of some of the other um, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's the Bible and the Bible only. Sola Scriptura, I think, is the term. And so you cannot question slightest cross the T or dot of the I. And, uh, and once you do other things start to open up. So right. for me, it was this idea of hell. Well, if we're wrong about the idea of hell, that opens up the idea that scripture is not perfect, not yeah, infallible. Yeah. Right. And then you can start doing other things. Now for some people, it's like, okay, you start with scripture is not infallible. Now, what do I believe about hell and creation and Paul's writings? Uh, Other people need to start with a specific topic. Okay. Evolution is true. I'm a scientist and I believe it. Now, how does that affect what I believe about the Bible? Uh That's perfectness. So a chicken before the egg. And, you know, I don't want to tell anyone how to do it or what their one thing is. Mine was hell. And that kind of got the ball rolling. Others, it might be, you know, a, a woman wants to be a lead pastor you know she's got a uh, this uh, personality where she wants to teach and help others and she's not allowed to in the german baptist or in evangelical churches and or most like most evangelical churches don't allow that and uh and so for her that might be the the one item that causes her to rethink how Literally, we take Paul's writings. I've got a lot more thoughts about all of that. I, it's not related to German Baptists specifically, but you know, I don't think German Baptists have the opportunity to even dig into it and question those things. You, you don't read anything outside of the King James version and maybe a few other, you know, writings. But for the most part, like the Holy Spirit helps you interpret Scripture and. So does church um, tradition, and you don't 
you're, like if you go read some Bible scholar like Bart Ehrman, who uh, you know is a textual critic and says, "Hey, that's not what Jesus actually said when this was written down here." Okay. Uh, a German Baptist would look at somebody like Bart Ehrman and say, "Okay, well, this is a demonic attack on our Christian faith." His, you know, the, the German Baptist. This is one thing I forgot to mention. They don't believe in higher education for the most part. And so, I mean, yeah, you can go to school to become a nurse. You, there are some with college degrees, but the, the idea of going to a theological seminary or being um, trained in theology is completely like that. It, it's not only not encouraged. Um, it, it, I don't think it would be allowed maybe a little bit, maybe the new conference will allow it a little more, but uh, elders preachers are elected by the congregation based on their character in the community uh, and some prayer, I'm sure, and all that stuff. So, you know, somebody may not even necessarily want to be a preacher or an elder, but the community says, hey, you're a respectful person. You're a man of uh, one wife. You uh, are not an alcoholic. You know, all the things in First Timothy that line out what a elder yeah. should be. You grow a fantastic you beard. You grow a fantastic beard. Well, some of them, <laughs> I know one guy who got voted in and he had to start growing a beard because of it. So what it does, though, is it keeps things simple, right? There is no, let's dig into what the actual Greek meant and what its translation is. It doesn't matter. What does the King James Version say specifically? Uh, And every word that is Sheol or Gehenna or Tartarus or Hades is translated as hell. So everything is hell. There is no um, study into that word. And there shouldn't be because the Holy Spirit gave us the King James Version, and we're going to read it. It's pretty clear. It's right there. It's in English. And that um, basically is is how they teach. And if you go to seminary, you start getting, you start putting your own thoughts or historian and, uh, you know, scholars' thoughts into spiritual matters, and you should not do that. Then that leads to taking things literally like a holy kiss where you really shouldn't. You're not even reading that in its cultural context, right? You're just taking it how you want to, and yeah. then it's like a big deal, and you can't not do it, you know? So, like that, like you said, there's no space to kind of uh, take something that you're not sure about, uh, mull it over, research it, pick it apart, and come to your own conclusion on what you think that means. And perhaps maybe people who are thinking about moving away from, from a, a group such as this one uh, that would be a good place to start. Take something that maybe doesn't sound like a hundred percent, or something that doesn't sit right, or something that you think kind of it, it may be a bit over exaggerated, or doesn't seem like it could have happened. Like, can somebody really turn water into wine? And then things like witchcraft are seen as like not something that's allowed within a lot of these a lot of these religious movements and that's why you know things like harry potter's not allowed to be read because it's witchcraft but it's also secular material so you know take something that maybe doesn't sit right maybe doesn't add up and start to think it over pick it apart pull it apart research it something small Mm -hmm. and, and once you're able to kind of go through that process with something smaller maybe you can build on it and build on it until you are coming up with free thinking, independent thought around the religion itself, the experiences that you've had growing up. I think that's some really fantastic advice that, that you've just given there. And, and it's it's kind of not just, and I'm, I'm not saying that this, this isn't the right way because for some people it, it, it probably most definitely is, but you know, we don't just want to slap uh, therapy go to therapy and that's the answer to everything you know because I don't think it is sometimes it's the the smaller steps and and starting very small and, and working your way up and maybe this is the type of advice that a therapist would give um you know and I know that therapy is is a fantastic resource and a great tool for some people but for for those kind of just starting to think about moving out of their group and can't do something like attend therapy because it would raise questions within the family environment, the church environment uh, and things like that. Maybe just kind of setting aside five or 10 minutes a day to have a thought or a feeling about something that can then grow is a really, really great place to start. So um, 
<laughs> we, there is so much more we could talk about. We, I say this all the time, but we have literally just scratched the surface. And I didn't even know that there was a whole other movement that we could have talked about today. We wouldn't have been able to fit it in to still get all the good stuff that you've told us today. But I, I always feel like I'm leaving these interviews without like checking all the boxes. Um, but I, we've covered so much and it's been really insightful for me. And I really have learned a lot about a uh, movement that I had no idea even existed until, you know, you, you got in touch to, to, to come and, and chat with me on the podcast. So I just want to say that I really appreciate your time. I'm glad that you are happy with your wife and your children and your dog and, uh, and that you're in a position to be able to work through now at your own pace, you know, where your beliefs lie, um, and uh, and have those those processes in place for yourself to to work through those things and um and go on that journey independently without the pressure of attending a religious group that you no longer kind of feel um dedicated to so thank you so much for your time today jordan i did this has just been great oh uh, yeah i've appreciate it. It's nice to tell my story and, um, you know, kind of <laughs> get it all out there and rethink about it. I, I mean, it, it's been a while since I had thought about my time in the group. So I mm -hmm. appreciate you having me on and I would be very interested in hearing, you know, another Anabaptist uh, members experience in leaving if, if you end up finding one or. Yes, um, yeah. If anybody listening even, has experience in one of these groups and would like to come forward, then please do. I would yes. love to chat with you to learn more, especially because like we've said, like you've given us such a great introduction into the movement, but I feel like we have only just scratched the surface. And likewise, if anybody would be interested in hearing Jordan's story about being involved in a conservative evangelical movement that does include politics in America right now, then let me know because I will get in touch with Jordan and ask him if he'd be interested in a follow-up episode. Uh, so well, I, I, I certainly would. And I would be interested in hearing somebody who is a part of like um, in America, like the QAnon stuff. I know it's not religious group, but it is kind of a weird cult like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. belief of like the vaccine is, uh, you know, it aligns with a lot of yeah. the, uh, the evangelical yes. movement at the moment. They're kind of becoming sort of blurred into Yes, twines, they really are. Yes. Indistinguishable. <laughs> I would love to hear somebody's story about leaving that and what took them out of it because mm -hmm. I have family members in it and I want to know how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. please, if you're listening and you have left it or know someone who's left it, I think it would be awesome to hear their story. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Well. Yes. And I want to leave one, one more thing. If anybody's still listening, there is a really interesting thing. If you want to look up called the Munster rebellion, it was radical Anabaptists back in the 1500s who like seized a city and like started, like just took it over. And then like the German government or something had to like come in and take them down and killed the leaders and put them up in these cages that you can still go to the city and see these cages hanging off the side of the building. What? Really like way off the wall story about Anabaptists. Um, there's a podcast by Dan Carlin on it. That's super interesting, super off the wall. I just remembered it and thought it, I just would mention if it takes mm -hmm. anyone's interest. Yes. So yeah. That sounds, and, that sounds and um, very non-pacifist. Um, no, no. And, and interesting. <laughs> so anybody that's looking for any support or advice to read other people's stories or to put their own story forward, there's r slash evangelical subreddit that you can go to. I'll put a, lo a link in the episode description. And for anybody that has family or friends involved in the QAnon movement and looking for support or advice with that as well, there's the QAnon casualties subreddit that you can go to for support. I'll put both of those in the episode description. Um, and I think that's everything, Jordan. I think, I think we've covered yep. everything. We've covered a lot. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Yeah. Have a good, uh, have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, Jordan. Bye. That is the end of this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find me at coltvoltpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvoltpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, 
And this has been The Cult Vault. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more. If you're a movie collector, you need Movies Anywhere. It pulls your favorite purchase movies from participating digital retailers into one central place. So you can finally say goodbye to scattered movie collections and hello to an organized library. With Movies Anywhere, you can watch your favorite movies on any compatible device whenever and wherever you want. Ready to grow and enjoy your digital collection? Visit MoviesAnywhere.com slash welcome and register for free. Registration with Movies Anywhere required. Open to U.S. residents 13 and over.